this. Um, I think it's hosted by uh, the guy from Whose Line? Wayne Brady. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? So, it almost doesn't matter if you know what I'm talking about. At the end of the show, they'll take three people that had the highest winnings. So during the show, each person had their own little moment in the spotlight. They all wear stupid or interesting costumes. Um, at the end of the show, they'll say, if you give us all your winnings back, we'll let you pick a door. And behind one of the doors is like, let's say $50,000, right? So there's three doors. Behind one of these doors is $50,000. And behind the other two doors, there's goats. And assuming you didn't come to the show hoping to win a goat, the goat would be a bad outcome, right? You want the $50,000. So door one, two, three, there's, there's $50,000 behind one of those doors. Somebody tell me a door to pick. Three? Is that what you said? What happened? One? Okay, I heard a three. One? One. It doesn't matter which one. So you, let's go for one. Okay. What's the probability you chose the right door? This is not a big probability question. So One out of three. Is everybody cool with that? So in general, so we're going to see a lot of supposed different formulas for probabilities. They're always the same. Probability is always the same. Why did you say one out of three? Because there's only one that matches what we want out of three choices, correct? So probability in general is always the number of things that's looking and that matches what we're looking for divided by the total number of things it could be. So there's one door matching what we're hoping for and there's three doors I could pick from. So that's why it's a one third chance. Okay, I like it. Um, now, here's the way this works. Probability that we won is one out of three. What I do then as the host is I play with your mind. And I say, all right, I'm going to open up door number two. And I show you there's a little mutant goat. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm going to put a sign on him so everybody knows he's a goat. Okay. It's more like spider goat. I don't know. Spider goat. You guys all with me? And then I ask you, do you want to switch? Has anybody ever heard this? If you watched Mythbusters at all, they did it once. Hmm? You did. You watched Mythbusters? No, no, no. Oh, the show. Oh, the movie Twenty One. Okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. The Twenty One's where they teach you how to cheat at cards, but it's too late now because they've already built in safeguards against all the, the methods. Oh well, too bad for us. Do you guys think it would change your probability of winning if you switch doors? What do you think the probability is right now that we, we pick the winning door? 50%. And you would be wrong. You would be very wrong. What was it to begin with? One out of three, right? Which means the probability, after we made this pick, these had a two out of three chance of having the prize, correct? They still have a two out of three chance of having the prize. I just was given more information that that's not the one. So if I switch doors... I double my probability of winning. And the funny thing is, I in my head, I put the prize behind door number three, which is why I was like, did somebody say three? Okay. Now watch, let me show you this. I know there's a lot of people out there that are still, what if I had 100 doors, okay? Ready with me? Bah, bah, bah. So this is door one, two, three, 99, 100. Because you've got to think about why the host opened this door. Of course he's not going to open this door or else the show is over. No tension, no drama. Why would you do that shit? Right? You want to build up rent, uh, ratings. Okay. So, pick a number 1 to 100. 76. 76. Okay, so you pick door number 76. As I, the host, I open up every other door besides uh, 97. I open up every other door. Go, go, go. Go, go. And then I ask you, do you want to switch? What was the chances you just happened to pick the door when you first picked the door? What's the probability you picked the right door? One out of a hundred chance. The host knows 
where the freaking goat is, right? Why would the host not have opened this door? Either you pick the right door and it doesn't matter which door he doesn't open. Are you guys with me? Or you pick the wrong door and that's the freaking prize. Which one's more likely? So one out of 100 chance you pick the correct door. 99 out of 100 times you're going to pick a freaking goat. You guys with me? So why did the host open the doors that he did? More than likely, it's because that door has the prize. So if you switch doors, you increase your chances of winning by 99 times. You still might lose. Why is the probability, if you switch, why would you not want to switch? Because you picked the right door in the beginning. But what's the probability you picked the right door? So how often is it bad to switch? One out of 100 times. So how often is it better to switch? 99 out of 100 times. Again, the whole thing about this problem is the host knows everything. So there's a specific door they did not open. When I opened this door, I didn't open this one because that's where the prize was. There was only a one-third chance that both of these had goats because you picked the right one. Then it doesn't matter which door I open. So more than likely, I opened the door I did because the other door has a prize. So when there's only three doors, you can double your chances of winning. Now, real quick, I'm gonna let this go <laughs> because my real purpose for showing you this is just to show you how probability is not uh, inherent. It's not instinctual. We're not programmed to understand most probability, which is why it's not, it doesn't just come to us. Very often it's counterintuitive. You guys still are with me? I'm not trying to tell you that we're gonna have a horrible time in chapter three, or that's not going to make any sense. I'm just trying to tell you, you have to trust sometimes in the process, because there's no way our little crazy reptilian brains will freaking know what the answer should be on some of these problems. Okay, maybe, maybe. All right, I'll let that go. Um, there. Okay, so those two problems together, the birthday paradox, so you can Google that if you want to see some of the math behind it. And the Monty Hall problem was what's this called because it used to be Monty Hall way back in the day that hosted the show. So you can look that up if you want to. Um, but their only purpose here was to show you probability is not instinctual. Okay. Now, a lot of probability is very simple. So if I ask you, if I flip a coin, what's the probability I get a tails? Fair coin. Big coin, apparently. Big ass coin. If I flip this coin, fair coin, what's the probability I get a tails? One out of two, 50%, correct? I love it. What does that mean? If I flip it once, I'm gonna get something, correct? I'm not gonna get half a head and half a tail. What, what does 50% mean? Think about it. What does that even freaking mean? Because if I do something once, it doesn't mean shit, right? I'm gonna get something. I'm not gonna get half of something. So what does 50% mean? You don't freaking know, dude. That's why we signed up for this course. Okay, I'm sorry. If I were to flip that coin a thousand times, now it makes sense. How many would I expect to be tails? Uh, be more specific. 500, correct? You with me? Everybody with me? So if I flip it a thousand times, number one, I'm worried about my life. Why I'm doing that. It's like, should be better things to do, but... Uh, but number two is, if I get 499 tails, does that freak me out? Didn't we just say we expect 500? But if I get 499, does that freak me out? No. What about 480 tails? Would that freak you out instead of 500? We expected 500, correct? But what if I get 480? Is that, how does that fuel to you? So right now this is subjective. You don't like it? It's you're not. suspicious? No, oh, you're okay. Okay. Yeah, I like it. So I was waiting for somebody to go, I don't know, man. What about 200 tails? What if I get 200? 200 out of 1,000. And we expected how many? We expected 500. What if we only get 200 tails and 800 hits? How do you feel? Some of you guys, you're very okay with it. You're like, a coin could do whatever the hell. It could, it could create a little black hole. It could become multicolored. It could become a little disco ball. I would be cool with it. You guys, all right, anybody freaking out if I only get 200? Out of a thousand? What if I got five? <laughs> I love you. 
awesome. What if you get negative 10? <laughs> Dude, it's fine. It's just another dimension. You, you know, no problem. Okay, so let's come back. Okay. Look, somewhere there's a line. You guys agree? Somewhere there's a line where the amount of tails becomes unusual. We've already used that word in here, correct? What does that word right now mean to us? Unusual starts when? How far away? Two steps away. Two standard deviations away, correct? You guys all with me? So if we just had to fill, and we already know what the average is. If I flip a coin a thousand times, what's the average number of tails I should get? You already told me. What's the expected value? What's the expected number of tails? 500. So the, if I do, if I flip a coin a thousand times, and I do that a lot, I'm going to get an average of 500 tails. Is everybody with me? Everybody with me? If I get 200 tails, that is good evidence that that coin is weighted. It's weighted to, be, to show up heads instead of tails. Are you guys kind of with me? Maybe? Okay. All right, all right. Um, so probabilities don't mean anything until we start talking about a large amount of, of doing something. So if there's a 5% chance that uh, a meteorite will land on uh, Grossmont College's, a uh, small one, guys, don't freak out. A little meteorite will land somewhere on Grossman College's land. There's a 5% chance. Then it's probably not going to happen today. But if I give it enough time, it could happen, correct? So 5% over the course of a long period of time starts to mean something. And maybe. All right. So let's, let's, let's get to somewhere more concrete, okay? which I, I imagine that's what a lot of my students are often screaming in their mind. Can we get to something concrete? Okay. There's a certain kind of probability problem that I like to give you. And we're actually gonna use this to create the formulas. We're not, I'm not gonna give you the formulas. You are basically gonna make them. If you don't make them right, we're all screwed. No, I'm joking. I'm gonna push you in the right direction a little bit if I need to. Uh, this is called a contingency table. The name does not matter, but it's called a contingency table. Are you working? No. Do I have any? No. Work. Let's see. Okay. All right. So let's say we have. Uh, let's see. Sure. I like it. So say we talk to. Um, uh, let's see, it doesn't matter. Let's see. Say we talk to uh, college graduates and non graduates. You with me? And let's say we ask them a question, and the question and the answers could be yes, no, maybe. So I should have made one more. We'll be, we'll be fine. Let's make one more thing here. Creativity is running low, so I don't know what the question is. But we ask them a question. They could say yes, no, or maybe. Let's say that, uh, say, 40 of these say yes, 3 say no, and 11 say maybe. Let's say 17 of these say yes, uh, 38 say no, and 5 say maybe. Okay. <laughs> Some of you guys are getting... <laughs> More of the amusement out of this than I thought you would. Um, how many total people said yes? Okay, good. Keep going. How many people said no? 41, maybe. 16. How many people are graduates? 54. And how many people are not graduates? 60. Okay, that's pretty easy, right? What do you think I want to go in that very corner corner? Total number of people, right? So what I get is people will add these people to these people, but why, why is that silly? Yeah, these people are these people, correct? Just categorized differently. So if you add these up, you get 114, and this better be 114 also. That's a way to check to make sure you're doing right. Alright. 
So there are just probabilities just jumping out of this thing. For example, let me see what you guys think about this. Don't say anything, just think about it for a minute. What's the probability if I pick one person from this group, what's the probability that they said maybe? Just think about it for a second. All right, what you got? 16 out of 16? Yeah. 16 out of? 114, well, yeah, good. Every answer to a probability question has to be between what two things? What's the lowest the probability can be? Zero, correct? That means that ain't gonna happen. A negative probability, what the hell would that mean? Don't know. What's the highest probability it could be? 100%, so the whole give, your, give it 110%, that's a total mental thing, it's not an actual mathematical. I like it. 16 out of 114. What is that as a decimal? Somebody help me out. 7 out of 57. Don't make me do this. So it's point? 1, 4. 1, 4. Uh, 0, 3, 5. 0, 3, 5, so 0, 4. Yeah. All right. Okay. So on uh, Jeff's magical ride of, of arbitrary uh, rounding, at least at the moment, this seems a little arbitrary. I want every probability as a decimal to go four decimal places. You guys all with me? Pretty soon we're going to be using this table. It's going to give us all the answers to four decimal places, so I just want us to get used to seeing it that way. And then you can make it a percentage if you want to. Okay. I think orange is not the best. All right. Come here. Uh, all right, so what about this? Probability that I pick somebody who is a graduate. What's up? 54 out of? 114. Let's see, three and a half, so three, point four two and a half, point four nine, point four nine, something? What is it? 0.47. You sound so disappointed. You only come on, Matt. 0.47. 3, 7. 4, 7, 3, 7? Yeah. And you can make that 47.37%. Okay, this is not anything extra exciting completely agree but it's really nice when it's a little boring and it makes sense it sucks when it's boring and it doesn't make sense um all right so let's get a little more exciting what about the probability that I get somebody who said no or they're a non-grad or yep So what's probability again? It's always the total number of things that match what you're looking for divided by the total it could be. So the bottom is almost always going to be, in this case, 114. There's one time it's going to change. We'll talk about that in a minute, but we haven't hit that yet. So how many people said no? 41. How many people are not graduates? 60. What's wrong with just adding those together? Again? Yeah, so if I count these people, I need another color. Damn it. Oh, okay. So, if I count these people, <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. 
If I count these people and these people, now can you see what the problem is? How many people did I count twice? 38, right? So if I want to do it kind of directly without being clever at all, I would say 41 said no plus 60 are non-graduates minus 38 that I counted twice because they only get one time to count, correct? I don't want to double count anybody. How's that? Is that all right? Out of what? 114. Now, you could be smart about this and say, all right, what about if I do 60 non-graduates plus the three no's I didn't count yet? Does that make sense? Isn't that going to be 60 plus 41 minus 38 is 3? Do you guys see that? So, of course, the math doesn't care which way you do it. So you could be smart about it and go, I'm going to count all these people. I already counted those no's, so you just have to add three. Because that's what we get here. We get 63 out of 114, which is something. If anybody can help me out. Let's see. Please save me for myself. I'm trying to do that in my head. What is it? Point five five two six. Is that all good? Yeah. And I'm not doing these myself. Just make sure that it's rounded correctly too every time, right? So when you round, don't just cut things off. Actually round. Okay, maybe. Let's take a minute right now. Let's actually create a formula. We don't have any pop, uh, probability formulas at all. I haven't given you anything. I just gave you the idea. Probability is the number of things that match what we're looking for divided by the total things it could be. But we're gonna create a formula based off of what the hell we just did. In fact, let me do one more thing and then we'll, we'll do it. I think this will make it a little easier. Um, what's the probability that, uh, yeah, let's see. Somebody said yes, and they're a graduate. So here's my little thing about and and or. I don't think I've told you guys this yet, this silly example. Uh, let's say I'm going to a bar or a nightclub, and there's a bouncer. There's like a bouncer, he's got a list of people, right? He's got the little rope and everything. And he says to me, he says, to get into this bar, so, so there's two bouncers. One night there's the and bouncer, and one night there's the or bouncer. So the and bouncer says, to get into this bar, you have to know Joe the bartender. I know Joe, hey Joe. And you have to have a lot of money. Shit. And you have to dress nice. Shit. So I don't get in, right? I like how some of you guys are phrasing on dressing. Um, you guys all with me. So and is very restrictive. Uh, real quick thing about and. Have any of you ever looked at scholarships? Anybody ever considered applying for a scholarship or thinking about it for the future? I highly recommend you do that. There's stupid amounts of money out there. Back in my day, back in my day, there was, I do this because there's this book. It was about this big in the financial aid office. And you went to the financial aid office, you got the book and you opened it up and you started looking at the requirements and they had all these scholarships. It was insane. This, the requirements would say, must be a math major. Check. Must have this GPA. Just barely. Must, uh, blah, blah, blah. And then at the very bottom it would say, uh, must be uh, over 35% Native American. Damn it! <laughs> right? So then I have to go to the next one. Because they are all ands. You have to meet all of those requirements. Do you guys understand? So ands will always decrease the probability you'll get in. Ands will always decrease the size of what I'm gonna put on the top. Does that make sense? Because you have to meet all the requirements. The or bouncer, I walk up to the or bouncer and the or bouncer says, all right, to get in, you have to dress nice. Damn. You have to have a lot of money. Or, or you have to have a lot of money. Damn. Or you have to know Joe. I know Joe, so I get the hell in. I go in. Because those ors. Does that make sense? Ors always make things bigger. More and more people can get in when it's or. 
ands less and less and less. Does that make sense? Okay, maybe. So how do I answer this question then? How many people, they have to meet both requirements. They must have said yes, and they have to be a graduate. How many people are we talking about? Is it 40? I don't know. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. 40, yes, 40. Because okay. they have to be, have, they must have said yes, and they must be a graduate. So we often call it the intersection. And is often called the intersection. You see why? It's where the two categories intersect. So 40 people meet both requirements. So it'll be 40 out of 114. Whatever the hell that is. Zero, zero point three five zero eight. Three five zero eight. Mm-hmm. Or 35.08 percent, whatever you want to do. Cool. Okay. All right, I like it. So looking back at this thing, let's break this down. Let's create our first formula. Uh, it's going to be for or. When we did this, what was 41 out of 114? What is that? Fourteen zero four seven. What was 41 out of 114? What did it represent? Yeah, you guys are so quiet. I think some people said no, I think is what I heard yesterday. All right, so people said no. So this would be the probability they said no plus What's this one? Non-grad students. Minus, what's this one? We threw them out because what kind of, what, who are they? What category were they in? They were in both categories, correct? So those are the non-grads, and they said no, correct? So the formula for or is one plus the other one minus the ones that are both. So written more generally, written a little more generally, if I have the probability of A or B, where A is an event and B is some other event. An event could be somebody said no. An event could be I flipped a table. An event could be it's 37 degrees outside. Whatever. This formula is take one, add it to the other one, but subtract any that are both. And I really want to highlight, this is an example of a formula we did not know until we actually calculated something and we looked back and said, oh, that's what we did. So a lot of mathematics, a lot of formulas are just based on what we observe, we do, or what happens. And then we capture it in a formula. If I give you everything you need to be able to count, you're going to use less formulas. You're not going to use the formulas at all. You're just going to do what we did. So I'll show you an example of a problem where we'd actually use this formula directly later. But everybody understand, we just developed this formula, but we did a problem without knowing the damn formula, didn't we? Because we just applied the idea of probability. So if I give you a problem like that, don't even look at the damn formulas. They're going to mess you up. Okay. Now, let's make it even more interesting. You're all like, I don't know, Jeff. It's already. Wait, I have a question. Yes. I'm sorry. I, I'll write it down. I missed. Why did you write um, minus because that's what we did, right? On the left, underneath. I know, because this is that. That's the whole idea. That is an or that we calculated, correct? And we, right? This is an or question that we calculated, right? Okay. We did. There it is. And I'm saying, let's go see what we did and construct a formula out of it. Because everything we did, we would have done no matter what the categories were. So we took the probability of, they said no plus the probability they're non-grad, and we subtracted the probability that they're both, because we had to subtract anybody we double counted, correct? Okay. So then I just made it more, more general. No matter what the events are, that's the formula for or. And just to highlight this, because you guys are not used to this. 
we did the problem without a damn formula. So for this kind of problem, I don't need this formula. I don't. But that problem actually helped us create the formula. So now I can use it where I do need it, and I will show you an example where we will need it. Okay. Maybe, maybe. This is not one of those examples. We actually constructed the formula from what we did. Now, what about this question? The most interesting question so far. I'm on five. Okay. What's the probability that uh, somebody said uh, maybe, given that they're a grad student? So given means I'm telling you information. So the bottom is going to be 114 always, unless I know something about it. What's true about this person? What information did I give you? Let's read this. It's the probability that they're that they said maybe, given they're a grad student. So what did I tell you about them? What do you know? They're a grad student. So how many people could that be? So out of 54 people, so it's not 114 anymore. Why? Because we can throw out all the non-grads. I know this problem is not talking about a non-grad. I could throw them all out. Out of those 54, how many said maybe? 11. So the one time the bottom will not just be the total is if I actually give you information. If I said pick a card, it's going to be out of 52, correct? A normal deck of cards. If I said given it's a club, does anyone know how many it's going to be now? Out of 13. Because now I can throw out the rest, the hearts and the diamonds and the blue clovers and the balloons. No, it's like so given, a given probability is the only one that we see so far that will change the denominator. Because I'm throwing some people out, I'm focusing on a smaller group. Let's construct a formula for this. Right, actually, let's do one more example. Uh, what's the probability somebody is a non-grad given they said no? So this is where people make silly mistakes. What is it that I know about the person? Say it louder. What's known is they said no. So again, the whole point is I don't know how many non grads The probability they're a non-graduate. I don't know if they're non -grad. So The probability they're non -grad. Given that they said no. So the second dude is what I know. I know they said no. So how many people are we talking about now? Yeah, 40, out of those 41 people, how many are non-graduates? 38. 38. And whatever the hell that is. Let's construct. How are you guys doing? If you really think about it, every problem we've done, I know this is a little weird when I talked about the general formula a little bit, but every problem we've done, they've all been the total number that match what I'm looking for divided by the total number it could be. That's what they've all been. That's what probability is, period. The formulas look freaky because they're taking into account all the things that are happening in the problem. That's why I don't need the formula if I see everything to count. I don't need it. Okay, so let's look at the given formula. I'm going to erase all this business. Uh, you work. Yeah. So like, look at this guy. Let me see if you guys are cool with this. Um, oh crap, you're dying. You're dying right in front of my eyes. Alright. Alright, go with me for a second. I want to make this a little bit clear. 
It's 11 over 54, correct? It's going to seem a little weird, but go with me. I, most of the time I skip this, but I've decided just now, right now I decided not to. I'm not sure why. Are you guys all cool? Let me see if you guys are cool with this. Can't I multiply or divide the top by anything I want to? Except zero. Is that cool? We all know this. This is how fractions work. So for some reason, Jeff being a weird dude, I'm going to divide top and bottom by 114. What's special about 114? I didn't just pick it out of nowhere. Total number. So this, what does that represent? What does that represent? Say again. This person must be a grad student. And they said maybe, correct? Okay, so this will be probability of uh, maybe and grad student. Is that cool? And what's the bottom probability? Grad student. And that makes sense because, again, what does the bottom depend on or given? It always depends on the thing we know. Correct? There's 54 grad students, and we know they're a grad student. They told me they're a grad student. So, of course, I'm talking about 54 possibilities. If they don't tell me shit, if they just say, what's the probability uh, that somebody said maybe, well, it's going to be out of 114. I don't know anything about it. It could be any of the 114 people. But if you tell me they're a grad student, now we're talking about 54 people, right? So it makes sense the bottom is related to what was given. And then, let me see. Let me try to draw this. Have you guys ever seen this kind of picture before? Anybody know what that's called? Venn diagram, I love it. Named after Frank Venn. No, it's, that's all so bad. I forget his first name. But, um, so this is uh, the people that said maybe. And this is the grad uh, students. You with me? So this would be the grad students and maybes, because it's in both circles. You got to do this So if, I, if I'm given that the grad student circle happens, I'm given that it's a grad student. So could it be that kid? No. What about this person? Ain't no chance in hell. I'm given that it's a grad student. What's the only way that it could also be somebody who said maybe? Where do they have to be? In here. So it must be the and divided by the given. So if I know this circle happened, the only way it could also be in this circle is if it's in the intersection, if it's in the and, in the middle. And again, it's just another kind of a visual way to explain what I already explained computationally. Okay. So let me write this formula a little more broadly. Get that away, because that seems to be making some of you guys in pain. Um, if I have A given B, first thing is, I really don't like writing this. We're going to forever from now on, we're going to draw a straight line to mean given. Your favorite thing is when math people just arbitrarily make symbols mean shit. Right? Too bad. There's too many letters in the word given. Probability of one event given that the other event has happened is the probability of the and divided by the probability of the given. I don't know if you guys can all see all that. This room is not set up well for a whiteboard using teacher. Now, I've thrown a lot of stuff at you, but the math we've done has not been that uh, intense. But they're having quite a few different ideas. And we've developed two formulas. Does anyone see a formula missing? We did the OR formula, right? We did the given formula. Formula for AND, kick ass. Okay. The formula for AND is definitely more complicated, and I would never use it for this problem. Because if I say the probability grad and yes, I just have to see where they intersect. Why the hell would I want to use some formula? Do you guys see how it's got to be? It's got to be a little more complicated. 
because it's not easy to capture what we just did in a mathematical statement. Okay, I'm not sure if you guys understand or, or agree. So let me do this. Um, I want to kind of prime us for what this uh, uh, comes out to be. Right now, I'm thinking about primus demand for today. I want to prime us for what this is going to turn out to be. So I'm going to do two examples. One of them, uh, a little sad. And the other one could be illegal, well, too bad. So let me do the slightly illegal one and really emphasize that nothing illegal. So here's what I'm talking about. Let's say I want to join a fraternity, right? Yeah, what? You guys all, look, you all know what fraternities are? And those are, of course, the places I always, for some reason I forgot to say this, where you see Greek letters. Sigma, 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 alpha, and lambda, nu, and all that kind of stuff. Those are the other uh, Greek letters we don't talk about. So. Let's say that I go through hazing, and this hazing does not involve any alcohol, it does not involve, all right, so all it is, there's this long hallway, and everybody that wants to join, they gotta walk down this hallway, and every third step I take, somebody slaps me on this side of the face. And every fifth step I take, somebody slaps me on this side of the face. You all with me? How many steps until I get this happen? So you understand, third step, slap, fifth step, slap. Which step do I get both? 15. What did you do? Mathematically, what did you just do? Multiplied. Multiplied. You with me? Right? So, one third chance I'll get slapped on this cheek. Yes? One out of five chance, this cheek. One fifteenth chance I get slapped on this and this cheek. And. And. Okay. Stop hitting yourself. Okay. <laughs> Y'all with me? Here's the sad part. Uh, you guys, you guys know we used to have this thing called the, the there were the space shuttles that would get launched and they would do things. They would go around the Earth. They would have experiments. Y'all knew about this. So Jeff was I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm a, I'm a geek, a nerd and a geek, which is the greatest combination of those. Uh, so in the '80s, we would go out sometimes. I lived in Florida, so I did my time in Florida. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. If you like Florida. You're weird, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a little strong, but oh well, I live there. Um, and we would go out and we would watch the, the sh we would watch the shuttle take off. We, you could actually kind of not, we're not like right on it, but you could see it off in the distance and you could see the sun glinting off of it. It was awesome. So I don't know what really sucks. What is it, what's the saddest thing about the space shuttle program? The fact that what happened? Do you guys even know? Huh? Didn't it like fail to? And then they died, right? It blew up twice. I, I, it really sucks that I have to say, if I say the space shuttle, the, when it blew up, you actually have to say which time. That sucks. The first time it blew up, not too long after it took off. We'll be talking about that time. Say again? Uh, we lived in Miami for a little bit, and then we lived in Fort Pierce, and then we lived in Clearwater, which is right next to Tampa Bay. So just in case you're curious. Anyway. Um, so the day that this first, so, so the second shell uh, time, the second time it blew up, it's because the heat shield, too many of them had come off. And so when it came back in, it wasn't protected enough from the extreme heat, from just going the friction through the atmosphere that it, it blew up. And I think they're still finding pieces of it strewn across, I mean, they're strewn across this huge swath of land. Um, anyway, the first time it blew up, uh, Jeff was in English class, right? And for some reason, that day we didn't go out. English class, I'll never, I see it perfectly in my, in my brain. I'm sitting here, we were just reading, we were each taking turns reading out of a book, right? And they always liked, well, anyway, that was later in life when they would pick on me because my voice was changing, but not that time. Um, over the loud speaker that came on that said it blew up. So what had happened, and of course, that's a very uh, traumatic memory for me, but I'll be fine. Um, the reason it blew up was due to something called ovaries. Go with me. There were these, on the fuel line, on the fuel line, do you think you want the fuel to go in one direction or should it be able to go both ways in a fuel line? What do you think is a smart way to do things? Don't you want it to go one direction? Yeah. Okay, and not the band. You just want it to go in one direction, one way. So there's these things called O-rings. And what they basically do, they're sort of like valves. 
ensuring that it won't go back on itself, correct? Okay, everybody with me? That morning it was really cold. And for Florida, that doesn't have to be a lot, but it was cold enough that actually compromised the integrity of these O-rings. The material they were made out of in cold conditions made it not operate correctly. You guys all Why would they, they had several O-rings in a row. Why in general is that a good idea? Why would they want to have several? If one fails, if you live in a really, really bad part of town, which I definitely did for a while, save some money, as long as you survive, it's great. But what do you have on your door? Lots of locks. Multiple locks. In fact, different types of locks. Why? You want to decrease the chance somebody gets in, correct? So if they know how to do this one lock, here's a totally different lock. You know, if you're gonna get in, I'm gonna make you work for that shit, yes? If you live in a nice part of town, one lock, maybe a lock and a deadbolt at most, right? Okay, you guys all with me so far? But add the whole thing and the thing and another thing and a thing and a lock and a thing, yeah, okay. Why do we do this? Because if I have multiple, if this guy fails, these will still be doing their job. So if you really had to be up at 7 a.m. one morning, wouldn't you set multiple alarms? Has anybody ever done that? I definitely have. I set two alarms and told a friend to call me for damn sure. For, it was my uh, competency, my Anyway, you don't need to know that. Um, for getting my uh, master's degree, I'm like, I have to be up for this. Um, so let's pretend that there's a 1% chance, which is definitely a lot higher than it really is. A 1% chance that will fail, correct? So there's a 1% chance that that will fail, and there's a 1% chance that will fail. In normal operating conditions, if one of them fails, that doesn't have anything to do with what the other two will do, correct? If you go out and your neighbor, their car won't start, does that affect your car? Unless their battery is stolen, which happened to me too, which is great, in that one place with the lock so on. So. so you don't want this to act like an or, because you would just add these. That wouldn't make any sense. The probability that all three fail should not be 3%, correct? Otherwise, why would you put multiple of them in there? So what percent of the time will this fail? Well, 1%, Jeff, that's what you said. One out of 100 times, correct? Out of those times, how often will this one fail? 1% of those times. And then how often will this one fail? 1% of those times. Does that make sense? 1% of 1% of 1% of the time, all three will fail. So what's the operation I'm doing? Multiplication, again, slap, 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 multiplication, blah, 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 multiplication. This would be, how do I say this? This guy fails, and this guy fails, and this guy fails. So what am I really hammering home here? And means multiply. So what is this? You can do it like this, one over one. One, two, three, four, five, six zeros. One millionth of a chance that'll happen. You guys see it. So that's why we set multiple alarms, because one alarm might have a 2% chance to fail, but if I had three, that's a really small chance to fail. It's still a small chance, but I've really decreased it so much. You with me? like it. This is why we wear seatbelts, why we wear condoms, why we, wear, we do all these precautionary things is to try to decrease the probability. Uh, I, I almost don't want to talk about this. I definitely talked about this while we were in the pandemic. I don't want to know, please don't tell me, this is not a debate, this is nothing. I don't want to know if you think masks don't work. Keep it to yourself. I don't want to know because there's a ton of freaking research, but what we do is we decrease the chances in that case, that something spreads. Is it perfect? No. Is anything perfect? No. But we decrease the chance because guess what? That's all we could do. Okay. Um, so let's actually get the freaking formula. That would be nice, Jeff. Yes, true. Um, yeah, okay. So 
So real quick, I just want to summarize what we know so far, and then we'll create the formula for and. So what do we know so far? We know probably A or B. Who's got that one? Okay, I like it. This poor little dude. I am just eating through freaking markers today, man. Let me see. Okay. Everybody with me? That one we did earlier. So what is and, basically? What operation is and? And, I'm sorry. What operation is or? Addition, basically, right? It's got a little adjustment at the end in case you double count people. Or is basically add. You guys with me? Let me put and next, and then we'll put given. So here's the given. Given was probably of A and B divided by probability of B. You guys all with me? Do you see how, what is it we don't know yet? Do you see this anywhere? You see this in two places actually. One of them is there. Well that kind of sucks, that way sucks. What about this one? Couldn't I solve this for and? How would I solve this for the probability of A and B? Multiply by peanut butter, now PB, probability of B, right? So that would be, multiply that up. So it'd be probability of B times probability of A given B. Now what makes sense so far based on the silly examples I gave earlier? It's basically, like you said earlier, what's AND? AND is basically what, what operation? Multiplication. Multiplication. Bam, there's multiplication, right? What isn't immediately obvious is why is it this times that, right? All right, don't worry, we'll do some examples. I wanna show you one more thing based on this. By the way, by the way, I'm sure you've noticed this already. Today is a lot of me talking. Have you noticed that? There's a lot of me talking and I'm sort of getting over it, so I'm with you. Uh, next time I've got a this doesn't mean we're leaving. That's a phrase that makes people think we're leaving. Uh, I've got a handout, and I've got like a practice quiz. It's the one practice quiz I'm gonna give you, because remember, what's the next quiz happening? You all know what it is. It's on the, it's on the homework sheet. It's the one quiz is on the homework sheet. The double quiz, yeah, so I will give you a practice quiz for it. All double quiz means is it's about twice as long and it counts twice as much as a normal quiz. So let me show you one more thing. Can anybody, does this matter what these events are? This formula, it doesn't give a shit, right? It's just like any formula we see in algebra or whatever, just I can plug in whatever those events are. So can anybody tell me what the probability of B given A is? You could do it. Good, probably B and A. Over. What's on the bottom always? The thing that I was given. That makes sense, it's gonna be out of the given amount because I'm throwing everybody else out, you with me? So that formula is an idea. Whatever is here, goes here. The top is the end. Whatever here, goes here. The top is the end. You guys with me? Can't I solve this for and? So I get the probability. Is B and A different from A and B? Jim and Sam, Sam and Jim, are they different? No, okay. So probably of A and B equals probably of A times probably of B given A. Now, I wanna show you something. Which term in the or is the adjustment term? Does that make sense? I said this earlier, but which term is the adjustment term? Yeah, the minus B, so if I took that out, wouldn't it just be add the two probabilities? You with me? This one is the adjustment term for this. If I took that piece out, isn't it just A to, probably of A times probably B? You with me? Almost, okay, we're gonna get there, don't worry. This is basically probably of A plus probably B 
This is basically probably the times probably be. It's just got a little adjustment and a little adjustment. All right, so let me show you a nice concrete problem because this is just playing with letters. Let's do a concrete problem. Um, here, let's do the classic. We'll do a classic problem. Um, let's say I have a bag. Were you not working? No. You are like so not working. It doesn't matter, Jeff. You'll get it over. Let's say I have uh, seven uh, 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 green chips and eight red chips and five uh, white chips. Or red chips. Or tortilla chips. I don't know. I don't know about those green ones. If you reach in there and pick one chip, what's the probability that you pick a red chip, for example? Eight out of 20. Eight out of 20. If I multiply by five, we get 40 out of 100, so that's 40%. Is that cool? Nice. Now, let's do something different. What if I pick two chips? I'm going to do it in a very specific way. I'm going to do it with replacement. You know when you have like a mixture of chips, like they have the, the where they have the pretzels and the, and the tortilla chips and the, the Cheetos or whatever mixed, right? Munchies. Munchies, thank you. Uh, I'm also thinking about there's also this what's called taro chips and I have different kinds of things. Uh, if you reach in there and you pick out the one you don't like, you would drop it back in, your friend will look at you weird, you pick out the one you want and you eat it, correct? So this is what with replacement means. You reach in, you pick out one, you're like, I didn't want a green one, you throw it back in and you reach back in. Is everybody with me? So with replacement means it goes back in the back. Do you understand why that would be important? If I took one out and threw it away, how many chips are in the bag now? 19. Well, would that affect the probability of the next one? Yes, because now it's going to be out of 19. Okay, so this is with replacement. If I pick two chips with replacement, what's the probability I get? A white and then a red. Okay, let's see what you think. What's probably the first guy is a white chip? The first thing I pick is a white chip. Five out of 20. I throw him back in the back. I didn't want a white chip, man. So I reach back in and, and means multiply. What's probably I get a red next? Eight out of 20. Eight out of 20. Become a 20. And you multiply all that, yeah, I think you get 10%. Is that right? Yes. Trust me. Just trust me. 10%. So 10% chance you would get a white chip and then a red chip. What if I had picked three chips? What would change? Instead of one, two, I'd have times the third one, correct? So can you see this idea of probably first one times, the next one times, the next one? You can just keep going. However many you pick is how many spots you got. I love it. I love it. Yes? Based off the and equation, though. Yeah, I know. We're coming there. So let me ask you this. What does this symbol mean? Given. Given. If I pick a white chip and then I drop it back in the bag, does the probability I get a red chip next change? No. So the probability I get a red chip next, so let me see this, white and then red is probably of white times the probability of red given white. But isn't this the same as the probability of red? Because I dropped the first one back in. So it doesn't change, correct? Now go with me. I wasn't going to point this out until a minute, so let's do one more example. Um, now I'm going to do this. Pick 
without replacement. Okay. So what does that mean? That means I'm going to pick one, I'm going to feed it to my little brother, and I'm going to pick another one. Or just throw it away if you don't want to feed it to my little brother. Yeah. He's now freaking 44. <laughs> he's actually here. All right, he's, his dad's taller than my dad, so he's, he's taller than me. Um, so if I pick without replacement, that means that whatever chip I get first is going to get tossed out. It's not going to be included anymore. So I want to let's probably get a white and then a red. Same thing. Let's probably get a white chip. First pick. Five out of 20. Then you throw it away. Times. What's the probability of a red chip given that I just threw away a white chip? Given that I picked a white chip? Yeah, I, I still have eight red, correct? Out of 19 chips. So this would be the probability of white. That's probably white, right? Times the probability of red given that I picked the white first. Yes? Do you guys see that? Okay, I like it. This is leading up to an idea, a couple of ideas. Uh, so whatever the hell that is, what is that? Uh, 2 over 19, which is, who knows? Um, it's going to be a little more than 10%. It's so like 0.1054. You said that's the probability of white. And then a red. Picking a white chip, throwing it away, and then picking a red chip. So that's not given. Say again? So that involves giving or does it? It totally involved? does. Why is this 8 out of 19 instead of 8 out of 20, which is what probably red is? Why is it not that? Because it's given that I picked a white chip first. You with me? Yes? Sorry, can you write the formula down again? Oh, sure. Yeah. So probably white. And then red is probably of white times probably of red given white, for example. Right? So that's why this is different because given that I picked a white first and I threw it away, the probability of red changes. Now, what is that, by the way? What is 520 times 8 19 I think it's 0.1054, I think I said. I'm just making sure. What is it? Dude. I want somebody to go, I want my money back. This guy is supposed to know math. He ain't the bad shit. All right. So, real quick. What about if I wanted to pick two chips and I want to pick a red? I'm sorry. Yes, green, we haven't picked on green. A green and then another green. And this is still without replacement, right? So look what I do. Look what I do. I do, I got something and something else. So I got two spots to fill, correct? So it's probably the first guy is a green chip. Seven out of 20. And then I throw it away. So how many chips are in there now? How many green chips are in there now? So what's probably the next one's green? Six out of 19. What if I picked three chips and then I wanted another green? What would the next one be? Five out of 18. Do you guys see how that works? Because eventually if I try to pick eight chips and I wanted them all to be green, what should the answer be? I want to pick eight chips and throw them away as I do it. And I want them all to be green. Can I do that? So what should the answer be? Zero. If I keep going, seven out of 20, six out of 19, five out of 18, won't I eventually get to zero out of? Yes. If you didn't change as you went, you would never get to zero, which doesn't make physical sense. Okay, maybe. All right. God, today's boring. I'm sorry. <laughs> a lot of stuff to throw at you. All right. All right. Um, so there's a couple of ideas that we need to talk about. Um, that are related to what we just done. So let's talk about the second one first because it's related to this. So let me put the formula for the um, and up here again. So 
So if I do something with replacement, do the probabilities change in the problem? If I do it with replacement. If I did it with replacement, could I pick eight greens? Yes, because I keep putting the green back. Another green, another green, another green. I keep putting it back in the damn bag. So the probability stay constant, correct? Anytime I have a situation, let's see if this makes sense to you. If something happens and this guy doesn't give a shit. So let's say that, uh, looking at this guy. If A happens, and B doesn't care, then it happens. Sort of like we did with replacement. The first one was a white chip, and it threw it back in. The second guy was red. He didn't give a shit that we picked a white chip. He didn't, he didn't give a shit because the chip came back in. Who cares? But if I do it and I throw it away, now the second the red guy's like, wait a minute, there's less of this in here. Yes? I'm not saying the chip became sentient. I'm just saying things will change in that case. So if a happens and B doesn't give a shit, what would that look like? If A happens and B doesn't care, what should this equal? That's such a weird way to say it, I know. Let me see if anybody picks up on what I'm laying down. If A happens and B doesn't care, should the probability of B change? So it should stay the same. Oh my God, <laughs> there's a B. This is what's called independent. That should make sense, right? There's a guy in the classroom over there. He's wearing a red hat, a song. Let's say that he was late to class. Did it affect you at all? You didn't even know, did you? So when you say that you're independent from whatever his actions he takes, or he has taken, because you don't know this person, correct? Now later he might run into you in his car, but that would never. So the word independent in real life is exactly the same as statistics. The two things don't care what the other thing does. It doesn't affect them. Are you with me? So this is what would be called independent. This is actually the test for independence. If this is this, then A and B are independent. thing is related to the OR formula. When would this be zero? When would this one be zero? What would it look like in a chart? I have A and B. Oh, I'm sorry. A and B, C and D, what would be here to make that zero? You do it. What's the only way that that could be zero? Is if what was here? Zero. zero. If I put anything else there, it's gonna be that divided by the total, it's not gonna be zero, correct? Go with me. So the only way probably A and B can be zero is if there's no A's that are also B's. Let me ask you this. I walk into a room and there are bowls of ice cream and there are rocks. Correct? You with me? I'm blindfolded. Strange. I walk in and I pick something up. Uh, what's the probability that it is a bowl of ice cream and a rock? I love you guys. Pick a card from a deck of cards. What's the probability of a seven and a three? Zero. Zero percent chance, correct? Normal deck of cards I'm talking about. Not your freaky cards where you turn it this way, it's an ace. Every game. No. <laughs> you guys got it with me? Okay. So the only way that an and can be zero is if A and B don't share anything. So if I said A is women and B is Democrats, do they have an intersection? Are there women who are Democrats? Yes. You with me? You with me? If I said they were salamanders and shoes, 
Do they share, are there any salamanders that are also shoes? Oh man, that's making me sad now. I'm like, poor little salamander out there. Please don't use salamanders for shoes. So that should have no intersection. Are you with me? I used to do dogs and cats, but I don't know. It's a little old now, but you guys ever heard of the cartoon that was cat dog or whatever it was? Where the animal was both. And you didn't want to think about the biology of it too long. It would freak you out. Okay. All right. Um, so what we call it is if the probability of A and B is zero, we call that mutually exclusive. What does exclusive mean when I say that? What does that word mean to you? Exclusive. What's the reaction you get? What? If a club is exclusive, I mean, what's the root word of exclusive? Exclude. Exclude. What does that mean? Leave, Leave out. out, right? So if a club is exclusive, they won't let me in because they don't wear a tie. I own a tie. I'm not sure where it is right now. Uh, if they won't let me in because they don't wear a tie, that's an exclusive club. They only let people in that wear ties or dinner jackets or whatever. You with, you with me? So mutually exclusive means they do it to each other. Right? You can't, A says you can't be included in my group. B's like, that's cool because I don't, you can't be included in my group either. So they mutually exclude each other. So if I drew a Venn diagram, it would look like A and B. Right? It backs to each other. Okay. All right, maybe, maybe. So in the book, in the homework, this is a good note to take and to keep next to you as you do your homework. There will be problems that say, the very first sentence says, J and L are independent events. And what students do is they just go, words, here's numbers, let me do some shit to numbers. Now that very first sentence is stupid important. If I tell you J and L are independent, what does that mean? What can you write down mathematically? Independent. What does that mean? Sure, that's conceptually what it means. What's it mean mathematically? Sure, conceptually, what's it mean mathematically? What's the probability of J given L? J. If they're independent, given that L happened, J don't give a shit. Is the technical way to put it. Sorry. So Jeff and Leroy. Leroy does something. Jeff don't give a shit. Jeff's still doing his thing. It doesn't change his day at all. You with me? This is huge. Because the problem could say J and L are independent. Probably J given L equals 0.3. What's probably of J? And it should be easy as shit because those are the same thing. The answer is 0.3, correct? But if you skip the first sentence and you start to try to do formulas... You're going to be lost. You don't have enough information to do a formula. Same thing with a mutually exclusive. They're going to say, I think this book might call it disjoint. I can't remember now. Not that joint, but disjoint. Disjoint, a mutual exclusive, they sometimes refer to it as <laughs> disjoint. So I think this book calls it disjoint, but it really should be mutually exclusive. So if, I, if they say W and M are disjoint or mutual exclusive, that means that the probability of W and M is zero. So then you can use that in formulas. Are you guys with me? I'm trying to get you ready for these homework problems. Okay, don't skip that by. Okay. Today's been painful, I'm sorry. Yes. Could you explain the independence a little simpler? Uh sure. Um all right. Real quick, uh, cards. How many suits are in cards? Even if you don't know cards well, four, four suits. You're with me. So there's hearts, diamonds, uh, clubs, and spades. <laughs> God, Lord. Um, how many of each are there? Thirteen. Thirteen. And they are. Let's say ace is low for this. Eight, one, two, three, up to what? King. Jack, queen, king. And they all look like that, right? Ba 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 ba. 
Okay. Let's say I pick a card. So how many total cards are there? 52. All right, we took the jokers out. Say I, took a, I pick a card, what's the probability that I pick a king? If I pick one card. How many kings are there? Four. How many cards are there? 52. And that's a one out of 13 chance, yes? What's the probability I pick a king given that it's a club? What's the bottom going to be now? 52. Given that it's a club. Oh. So how many cards am I talking about? Four. 13. There's 13 clubs, correct? Mm -hmm. So given that it's a club, there's 13 clubs. Out of those 13 clubs, how many kings are there? One. There's one king of clubs, correct? Are these the same? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so these are... King and club are independent because knowing that I have a club in my hand does not change the probability that it's a king. So independent means knowing one thing happened does not change the probability of this other thing. So knowing, noticing that your neighbor forgot to mow their lawn, does that affect the probability that your car starts? No. So there's, that's an example of independent events. Could be a creative writing lesson to try to actually connect those things, but let's not go. Is that a little bit better? Yeah. So very few things in this world are truly independent because of such things as the butterfly effect, for example, right? A lot of things are, affect other people. So you could have a person you know nothing about that could drop something on the ground. You could find it, so they affected your life indirectly. So you're actually not independent of each other's actions. Are you guys semi with me? Okay, we're not going to suddenly become philosophy class. No, thank you. Are we all actually here? Uh, okay. We just did, by the way, I'm really bad about this. We just did basically every section of chapter three, believe it or not. So very first part of chapter three is the basics of probability. Then they talk about and and or. Then they talk about given. It's also called conditional probability. So next time I will have a handout. We will have practice we do. I'll have a practice quiz for the double quiz. We'll firm up a lot of things. There's a few little details I still need to fill in. Today was sort of overview. Uh, so next time I'm going to talk a lot less. Uh, you're welcome. So if you have any questions left over from the test or the grade sheet summary or whatever, come up and ask me. If you didn't get your stuff back, come up and get it back. Otherwise, I'll see you guys Wednesday.